The Information Technology and General Services Committee will now come to order. We have a quorum. I'll first announce that item number five will be put over to the next for three weeks. It will be heard in this committee in three weeks. So item number five will be put over. Next, we'll move to item number one. Item number one, communication from the mayor relative to the appointment of Ms. June Lagmay to permanent city clerk. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councilman. Well, thank you. This is a position that has a tremendous amount of responsibility. As a matter of fact, in one of the committee hearings this morning, there seemed to be some kind of lag time between the city clerk's office and communicating to one of the committees on some critical information. What skills or what experience do you bring to the situation or to this position, I should say, in order to make sure that you make improvements or you see the need for those improvements for that department? Okay. Councilman Cardenas and Councilman Parks, in answer to that question, what I am aware of is the procedure for transmitting that material consisted of adherence to the water conservation ordinance in which in the body of that ordinance, which council approved and is now an adopted ordinance, there is a procedure set out that says when DWP recommends to the mayor that the mayor go to phase three or phase four, that they so advise the mayor. The mayor then communicates that to the council. The council takes an action and then a resolution is, a declaration is established and is published. So the sequence of events was that the DWP did contact the mayor. The mayor issued a letter. The letter went to the clerk. I cannot speak on behalf of what happened in the clerk's office, that I wasn't there, but my understanding is that all materials are received, are timed in, are properly logged in according to the clerk's CFMS computer system. It was logged in a day after it was submitted and referred to the Energy and Environment Committee. That is the sequence of events on that particular issue. As far as continuing to make systems better, I am absolutely open, speaking, happy to speak with members of the council, members of their staff and city departments. Any and all ideas are welcome. I will bring to bear my best expertise and the good people who have that expertise to do that. In answer to your more general question, besides the issue of the letter that you referred to, my own experience, what was sort of great is applying for this position gave me the opportunity to look over my entire life and the experiences that I have had. You should know, for instance, that I am a native and proud daughter of Los Angeles. I was raised in the Echo Park area, just outside the borders of historic Filipino town. I used the local pools. Echo Park was my pool. Echo Park Library was my library. I danced every year in the Nisei Week Parade. You danced in what? The Nisei Week Parade in the Obon. I went to Our Lady of Loretto High School, which is an all-girls Catholic high school, a few blocks from Tommy's Hamburgers. Yes. And even at that age, my father had told me, you know, June, if you ever want to go to college, you're going to have to find your own way there because your mom and I can't afford to send you. My mom worked in sweatshops all her life in the garment industry. My dad was in a small plumbing company. So even at age 12, I worked summers in my dad's business. I went, saved money. I went to Pepperdine for the first year on a music scholarship, ran out of money, transferred to UCLA, where I 
also got uh, worked myself through school for four years, so I worked 20 hours a week and, and took credits. Uh, also did two years of graduate work in sociology. It was in college that I uh, developed a Asian identity because having gone, having grown up in Echo Park and gone to Our Lady of Loretto, I thought I was a Hispanic. And uh, uh, my mom always used to laugh. She says, "You speak Spanish better than you speak Japanese." So I'm one of those proud East LA Japanese types. I lived in City Terrace for you ten know years. Bill Fujioka. One more time. Do you know Bill Fujioka? Know Bill very well. The Fuji, as we call him. He um, has a similar story. Yes. To the Yes, it's great. Finding himself. Finding himself, that's right, um, which is a very personal journey. Um, finished school, I got involved in politics. That is to say, I worked at the Gay and Lesbian Community Services Center for a year and was uh, solicited to run the campaign of Don Amador, who was seeking to unseat Peggy Stevenson. Don lost, but Peggy's office came to me and said, we'd rather have you work for us than against us, and I was hired as a council aide for four years and established the first CD13 presence in the Silver Lake Echo Park area. So that was the first time that a district office was established for that region, which was just coming into its own with Sunset Junction and the burgeoning gentrification of the time. Um, after Peggy lost uh, re-election to Mike Wu, I went to work for assembl then Assemblywoman Gloria Molina, handled the Chinatown and Little Tokyo area for her, and also uh, spearheaded her No Prison in East L.A. campaign. But I missed the city, and I said, if I ever come back to the city, I would like to come back uh, in a civil service position. So I took the management assistant test, uh, went to personnel department, and worked as an exam uh, personnel examiner for two years, waiting for an opening in the city clerk's office to open up. I took that test, and I uh, became a legislative assistant and worked my way up to becoming the clerk of the Budget and Finance Committee uh, to then chair Xavier Oslovsky. Also did a number of other committees, such as uh, ad hoc Rodney King and ad hoc economic recovery. We were having a very bad recession at that time as well. Um, in addition to my duties as uh, chairing, um, clerking the Budget and Finance Committee, the division head also trained me to be acting division head in her absence, which means that I was responsible for coordinating the work of the other ledge assistants, making sure good work product was produced, that all uh, city rules, policies, and procedures were adhered to, and negotiating uh, solutions in difficult situations. Um, Mayor Reardon came to office about that time, and the chief of staff of the mayor's office went to the clerk and said, we need somebody to come over to the mayor's office and set up a mirror operation, a clerk within the mayor's office, if you will, to handle the immense amounts of paperwork and the important legislative items, which are all time sensitive. My name was recommended, and I did go to work for um, then Mayor Reardon, uh, stayed in his administration for seven years was essentially led to an empty office with a desk and a chair and said, welcome aboard, good luck. And so developed that office operation from scratch, hired an assistant. Um, when Reardon was termed out, Mayor Hahn asked me, interviewed me and asked me to stay on, and I did stay on, continuing to improve um, processes within the office, continuing to work closely with all council offices, the CAO, the chief legislative analyst, um, and the uh, other levels of government. When Mayor Villaraigosa came to office, I interviewed and he kept me on and I am continuing to do the same thing. I, which brings us up to today and brings me to you with a very eclectic and different skill set. Um, I have worked on both elected officials, staffs, and in city working departments. I think I understand the mentality and the demands of an elected official's office, but I know how departments are run, and I know the city ad code and charter that sets out the rules and procedures, and I think that I can navigate between the two worlds. Um, I also believe I have pretty much basically been raised by City Hall, having spent pretty much all my adult professional life here. And I hope to bring to the position creativity, uh, a sense of leadership, 
a sense of respect for the procedures, but still improving them, kicking the tires of the department, seeing where we can do better, and using the skills of very fine and experienced people who are already there to be more uh, service-oriented to, to, the, to the city family and, and beyond. And that concludes my statement. If you um, looked around and decided you wanted to create like a Filipino head of departments group, uh, how big would that group be by your guesstimation for the city of LA? There's already a city employees group for Filipino employees, left I base. Specifically for like general manager level. Oh, general manager? Uh, would you probably be the president? Vice President, Secretary, Treasurer, and all of the above. My <laughs> Filipino staff is telling me that we don't have any general managers who have uh, considered themselves Filipino. To be absolutely accurate, it's um, not a condition. Let me make it very clear <laughs> to the attorney. I'm just just out of curiosity. Uh, With all due respect, to my attention at that. Well, that's. I, I am very proud to be Filipino and. Um, Japanese. Uh, I can't even call myself Japanese American because technically I was born in Japan, and my parents were married there in the 50s in post-occupation uh, Japan. And my mom said to my dad, "Well, I guess you can leave us here, leave me a little money, and I'll open a tea shop with the daughter." And he says, "Nope, you're all coming with me to America, and my daughter's going to get an American education." So technically, I was born in Japan, but I was raised in Echo Park because my father had friends and relatives who are Filipino-American. I'm very proud of that. My father was one of the, and my family were one of the first that helped build St. Columban's Church in that community. Um, I'm equally proud of my, my Japanese side. I'm equally proud of my Polish side. My grandma uh, is, uh, her folks came over to Ellis Island. Um, Cheryl Soriano actually is serving as currently as interim uh, GM, uh, director of Children, Youth, and Families, but she, proud that she too is a Filipino American. <laughs> All right. Okay. So you split the duties. All right. Any questions? Let me just ask, what is, was your function when you worked in city clerk before? In city clerk, I was a ledge assistant like um, Adam is here, and I clerked the budget and finance committee. I clerked about six or seven other committees, a lot of them which were ad hoc because of the nature of the times, such as the Rodney King Incident Committee and um, ad hoc earthquake recovery and earthquake, I'm sorry, um, um, economic recovery because we had a recession at the time. But in addition to that, as I said, um, the chief of the division trained me in her absence. I learned how to run city elections from the legislative point of view, how to collect and ensure the accuracy of documents submitted by candidates, uh, arguments for, arguments against, ballot initiatives, um, making sure that the liaison relationship between the, the uh, different committees and the committee clerks was running efficiently and coordinating with the other divisions of the clerk's office. Let me just ask, uh, have you monitored what's going on in the whole election area where we're in the process of looking at the new system, new equipment, and uh, uh, revamping our, our current uh, system along with the county? Yes, sir. I am aware there are two uh, separate tracks that are being run, one on replacing the aging and obsolete uh, voting system, uh, voting tally system that we currently have, which is very awkward being that we only get provisional use of it by the Secretary of State. Um, I understand that that the council has directed the city clerk to participate in a working group with other departments and other electeds. And that report should be uh, released uh, either at the end of this month or the beginning of next month. On the separate track is a council instruction to the clerk to examine the ranked uh, voter, uh, ranked candidate or IRV uh, voting methodology. Um, I, I know that there are various cities that have tried it, mostly in Northern California and the city and county of San Francisco. That working group uh, is meeting regularly, and their results uh, hopefully will be uh, released to the council a little later uh, in the summer. 
Let me just ask, when did you accept the job? Is that last week or so? When did the mayor make my nomination? Yes. The mayor made my nomination on March 27th. Well before the budget was published? I just wanted to look at the budget was probably in the final stages. Did you happen to look at the budget when it came out yesterday? Yes, I did, sir. And did you see what they what was on the city clerk? Yes, I did. The issue is about 11 positions being moved. There are a number of challenges in that budget, some of which include the removal of the land records section in its entirety to engineering, and not all of those positions are proposed to transfer over. Also is a dividing by half nearly of our creative services division, which makes the proclamations and scrolls for the elected officials. What would that leave? It's about 18 positions. What does that leave you if all of those cuts go through? With a very difficult challenge. I'm meeting with... Numbers of people, do you know? May I call up the clerk? No, no, no. This is just... This is... This is your appointment, not the budget committee. Yeah. I just wondered if you knew what was remaining after the budget. I believe we asked for 150 positions, and we were cut to about 80, something like that. I think you only had 18 starting. Yeah, 150. We were cut by 30. 30. Okay. All right. Okay. I just wonder if you still accept the job. Wait, was that position cut? I've got Holly Walcott, chief, I'm sorry, XO of the division. I've got Conrad Carter, and I've got Todd Gadowski. And with good people like that, yes, I am willing to take on the challenge. You have three people. I've got more, but they happen to be here today. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Last chance. You still want the job? Okay. We have public comment card on item number one. Joyce Dillard. Now that I hear some of these budget cuts, I'm even worried more. I'm concerned about her heavy weight in the mayor's office for so many years. The mayor, I did read in the summary budget that he plans to do education. Those of you who have sat in Sacramento know that's a state function and has been taken to court, and he lost. And yet I see someone with a heavy background in legislation, not in elections, not in trust funds, which is part of this job, and probably someone that will be loyal to him. I'm worried about that because a lot of things are coming out of his office. They're all loyal to the mayor. We have CDBG money being decided by him and controlled by him now with the gang reduction. I mean, this aspect of clerk, you have a very good department. It's not perfect. Not every council file during the year is posted. Sometimes it's hard to find. But in all, you have a functioning department right now, at least for those of us that access records. Some of us look at it as a chance, and if you look at me, I'll tell you, for tourism and other things that aren't being addressed in this department. Because you do have people writing books. You do have the second largest city. So I see there's a hole in this, in the fact that there will be a problem with records. There will be a problem if land records move. There will be a problem with someone who only deals in legislation. This department has to outreach to the people because that's who access the records. And it has to be transparent, even more so now with the federal money. And those of us that are active, those of us that are also reaching out across the country, expect the second largest city to have that kind of aspect. And in this appointment, I'm here because I'm seeing it missing. And I'm very worried that it may become a conduit of just legislation only and just for the executive officer. And I think this department, in your analysis, needs to widen that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else here to make a public comment on item number one? Public comment is open on item number one. Seeing and hearing none, public comment on item number one is now closed. We have a motion to approve the appointment. Yes. Okay. Appointment is approved. Thank you. We now move to item number two. Item number two, city attorney report resolution relative to a request to destroy certain obsolete records from the Bureau of Contract Administration, Office of Contract Compliance, ECA slash 02-151 boxes, 
for the period January 1, 1992 through December 31, 1998. Gentlemen. Todd Godowski, City Clerk's Office, uh, Records Management Division. Have with us. Uh, James Thomas, Bureau of Contract Administration. Okay. So uh, I have one question uh, to the both of you. Uh, so you're here to confirm to this committee and the city council that all of the responsibilities and requirements in order to make this recommendation of disposal has all been covered and adhered to? Absolutely. The uh, request was prepared by the city clerk's office, reviewed and approved by the uh, Bureau of Contract Administration, also reviewed and approved by the city attorney's office. Okay. Okay. We have public comment card filled out by Joyce Dillard. Joyce? Thank you, gentlemen. Well, I'm concerned about records. It's hard to read from the list what, exactly if it's more than just minority business compliance. But in, in one section of um, contract compliance, I'm worried about how it applies to things ongoing now. I have friends that work with the methane issues. I have friends that sue over environmental documents. Are things being pulled out from this? The L.A. County is doing L.A. clean water. It's in private meetings right now for a parcel tax. Is there anything in groups of boxes like this that apply to that operation and maintenance parcel tax they're planning? Again, it's hard without going through every box. Part of City Cliff's job is really to expand that record retention um, criteria to pull out historic or applicable. I don't think this would be an historic designation, but it might be applicable to taxes or fees coming up. And I, I wish they, that a, a department like this is, that really isn't well known or tapped into can go through their records themselves and pull that that may help us in the long run reduce costs or, or make it less of a burden on the taxpayer. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Joy. Any questions? No. Okay. Anybody else here to make public comment on item number two? Public comment is open on item number two. Seeing and hearing none, public comment on item two is now closed. With that, the committee will approve the city attorney resolution. Thank you. We now move to item number three. Item number three, Department of General Services report relative to a request to amend a lease agreement with GSL Pharmacy, Inc., DBA Colfax Pharmacy for a pharmacy in the Browdy Retail Mall, Space E, located at 6262 Van Nuys Boulevard. Irene Saltzman, Asset Management General Services. Basically, this amendment just changes uh, the name uh, from Colfax Pharmacy uh, to its MAC Foundation uh, DBA City Pharmacy. So it'll be City Pharmacy now. Okay. But the, all other terms that were approved previously would remain the same. And the square footage of the facility? Uh, the square footage, one second. It's usually right here. Is, on my uh, 1,165 square feet, rentable square feet. Okay. And who pays the water and the power on that? They pay their, uh, the tenant will pay the utilities. They have separate meters. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, let me just ask, on the change from the rental agreement of, of a set cost versus a percentage, uh, the reason that was done is that it's a common industry practice. Um, there are certain prices they get for prescriptions, mm -hmm. and all of the pharmacies, or at least most of the pharmacies, uh, do not have a percentage rent. It's just a set rent. But what I was wondering, initially they signed and agreed to that. No, it hasn't been signed okay, because of this. Maybe I'm That's why we're amending it. It says here since June 2008. That was, uh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. We, that was when it was approved by council. Okay. So if they approved it, the council approved it with a percentage and a Correct. base cost. Now we're asking almost a year later to change it to the base cost. That has been one of the holdups to get this agreement signed. Okay. So. They've not been under lease since June 2008? Correct. Right. So they have what? It's uh, empty still. Oh, until still this empty. Is, yes. Okay. All right. So. 
We're trying to get this executed. It's not uncommon around here. Okay. <laughs> I've got some airport facilities that have been vacant for years. Okay. So the thing is we're trying to get them. We're in trying the to get, and it's a service for the employees and for the area to get a pharmacy but We had read it, so it looked like they were in business and we were no. doing. Okay. No. All right. That's right next to my district office. It's been empty forever. Okay. Actually, since it's been built. Um, any other questions? No. Okay. Um, okay. Anybody here to make public comment on item number three? I do not have any public comment cards on item number three. Seeing and hearing no one fill out a card or come forward. Item number three, public comment is now closed. With that, uh, the committee approves the GSD report. Thank you. Uh, item number four. Item number four, motion, Cardinus Wezar, relative to the feasibility of removing the use restriction condition in the grant deed of the Branford landfill property located at 12450 Branford Street. Anybody here from the report or any department to speak on this? Good afternoon, council members. My name is Madeline Rackley. I'm with the city administrative office. Okay. Um, one technical thing that I want to make sure we take care of before uh, we discuss this is apparently there was a typo and it was referred to as being in District 7, Council District 7. It's actually in Council District 6. Uh, before the last redistricting, this property was in Council District 7, but for the last uh, seven and a half years, it's been in Council District 6. So let's make sure that the documentation reflects that it's Council District 6. We will do that. Okay. Um, can you tell us what the timing uh, is for you to address the, your requirements and your, the expectations of your work sure, on this? Sure, sure. Um, uh, the CAO was asked by the mayor and uh, your office um, about two weeks ago to take a look at this project and report back on uh, and make some recommendations back to the council about how to proceed. So my involvement on this is really recent and um, to be able to provide you the best recommendation possible, I would like to ask for an extension of the time. I know that it, the, uh, um, it, uh, about 30 days, I think we can get that done in 30 days okay. for you. Um, and uh, to make sure that I understand the documents and the issues that the city attorney has and I'm speaking with the developers and, and making sure I understand so I can make the best recommendation Thank to you. Okay, so, so 30 day report. Yeah. Back 30 Let me just ask, when you do that evaluation, the one question I had, it was unclear, and I can understand changing the restriction, it was unclear as to why we put the restriction and what's changed that now the restriction is not necessary. And the second question I had mm -hmm. was, that do we have city oversight, such as our environmental affairs, as part of that assessment? Um, I can answer both of those questions generally. And the first is, my intention is to include some history of the project in my report so you understand what happened and why the change is happening. And uh, yes, EAD has been involved in this as well as several other city departments. So w you will get a, a, what I hope is an, a comprehensive recommendation that includes input from sanitation, GSD, the city attorney, uh, um, Planning. There were there were several departments involved. So. Thank you. Uh, we have one public comment card. Uh, Joyce Dillard. Yes, uh, this property apparently has um, a methane mitigation problem, so it needs to be building and safety and fire department included in that. I think that's important to sign off in any grant. Uh, deed de de uh, restriction to have that uh, uh, continue on or or have a problem solved in LA. We do not have a problem solved with methane mitigation. It is a problem in this city that really hasn't been addressed in its proper manner. Uh, it is in an earthquake area. It has some kind of proactive code enforcement case on it right now, which I couldn't tell what it was by what I looked at on the internet. And um, since it is compact filled land, I, I, do, I definitely need uh, needs a due diligence on this. I'm glad to hear, but it needs to be taken further into the fire department building and safety. Thank you. Um, 
question to the city attorney. Is there anything that um, in this motion that is asking that we exempt any department or anything? No. This, this motion, and I'm, for the record, I'm Noreen Vincent from the city attorney's office, and essentially with the motion you're asking that uh, a report be issued to you uh, discussing and describing the feasibility of lifting the restrictions on the property and essentially asking our office to also report on, should the council choose to lift the restrictions, how that could be accomplished. Mm -hmm. Okay. And all relevant requirements, et cetera, would, would be uh, delineated, correct? Yes, that, that is true. That is the whole purpose behind requesting the CAO do a report on this. And there have been a number of meetings involving uh, a number of departments, including the Environmental Affairs Department. I believe it was Street Services from uh, Public Works and any other department that needs to be involved will be contacted so that information necessary for the development of this report can be included. Okay. Um, thank you. And then also just to let you know, uh, it's likely that we're looking at not exactly 30 days, but we're probably going to hear the item for uh, two days from now, so 28 days. I'm sorry. We're likely oh, going to hear this item uh, and want to report back in, in four two days from now, which is not exactly 30 days, but basically Close. same time. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So with that, uh, we'll instruct the CAO and city attorneys and any other relative relevant departments uh, that are necessary to report back on this matter uh, in four weeks. Thank you. We will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Right. We now move to item number six. Item six, motion, Perry Rosendahl, relative to directing the Information Technology Agency to report with recommendations by which homeless households, including single room occupancy residents, can receive DTV converter box coupons. Good afternoon, Council Member Cardinus. William Imperial on behalf of the Information Technology Agency. With regard to this issue, there are two uh, sectors of the community that uh, this motion is asked to speak to with regard to the homeless and single resident occupants. Uh, the DTV coupon program specifically has targeted the SRO or the single resident occupants because they have defined household as all of the people who occupy a housing unit. unit. A housing unit is a house, an apartment, a mobile home, a group of rooms, or a single room occupied as separate living quarters. Separate living quarters are those in which the occupants live separately from any other people in the building and that have direct access from the outside of the building or through a common hall. The, the issue then becomes how do we target the, the homeless? And so in regard to that, it, it's very difficult to do that under this coupon program. We have begun to look at this issue through the stimulus package uh, applications that we have in or, or uh, RFQs that we've responded to so far. We hope to, to actually target that, but the DTV coupon, or should say the TV coupon program, has specifically said that a person who has an additional or an extra coupon can use that coupon for other people so long as they don't do it for profit. So that may be one way for us to get the word out that if you do have a coupon and you're willing to share with the neighbor or to turn over to somebody else who's in need of it who may be homeless, you can do that as long as you don't charge for it or try to give to a store or some other facility to do that. So we are working on that issue right now. We'd like to address that if we do receive monies going forward. And there are specific recommendations, I believe, that your office would like to make. And, and we're okay with those. We've, we've looked at some of those with regard to ensuring that, um, that we do as much as possible in our stimulus work, um, stimulus package work going forward. So that, that's what we have to report on right now. Okay. So the bottom line is uh, this concern or, or potential anxiety about single room occupancy residents uh, and in addition to that disabled, basically the, the most likely members of the community of Los Angeles that are likely to have to want to take advantage of these coupons, um, you feel comfortable that we're moving forward to to plug those holes and make sure that we're as, as effective in our outreach as possible to those communities? I think as of today, yes, given the limitations of the city economically to move forward without the stimulus pack package money, the, the monies that we're looking for, it's very difficult to do on-the-ground work. The request for uh, 
qualifications or RFPs as well that the FCC has issued specifically target home in home installation assistance for those that need it walk in centers and mobile centers and also expert installations for those that have problems with their antennas or additional converter box problems that they may have so I think if if we can get that funding I think we'll be in a much better position to attack this issue going forward the good thing by the way if I may add but I'll share that with you when we go to item number seven perhaps is the other work that I mean I'm sorry the other issue that the TV converter box program has allowed us to do a lot of what has come out from the FCC you'd be happy to know is that we IT has taken the lead in talking to the FCC we actually submitted comments to the FCC on the homeless on the the single resident occupants and on senior city senior centers we got them to extend these applications and the qualifications for the applications to these groups and and we did that by way of filing comments and saying that we had a large community of people that would be impacted if they didn't do so let me give an example with regard to the senior centers one of the good things is if you have a senior member there from your family you can actually apply for them even though they only have a room and but the only condition is is that the nursing home gets the coupons they receive the coupons and distribute them so all you got to do as a family member is apply for them give them the nursing home address and give them your your relatives names and new you can go ahead and get there in their name that's correct and then you and then you have the ability to talk with the nursing home to get the coupons from suit to go out and get the box for their bedside so we've gone forward with that work and also are is your department able to communicate with all the other departments such as disability and Department of Aging and also in addition to that making sure that we try to utilize our network of not-for-profits in the city in order to assist the outreach yes with regard to the applications that we've put in so far two of the three that we intend to to submit to the FC FC yeah sorry the FCC we are specifically naming the departments that we intend to work with in our application cover letters and Department of Aging Department of Housing and the Department of Disability as well and the not-for-profit organizations that various departments have relationships with the community yes CDD we've asked CDD to weigh in they've actually come up with about 11 different community organizations for the different RFPs that are out there so we're working with them as well there may even be an opportunity to work with some of the cable operators by the way with regard to the mobile centers because they already have these big semi trucks that have the centers and we're only going to need them for about eight weeks because as you know the the conversion is going to happen on June 12th and people will really be scrambling for a few weeks after that to try to get their their signal back what's the likelihood of there being the potential for opportunity of maybe some summer jobs for some of our youth or what have you engage them as well in our first RFP we particularly mentioned to the FCC that we were going to target at-risk youth under the various programs that we have I believe one of them is called PACE and another program that the mayor's office is actually working with this time there's also the California Conservation Corps the California the Cal I'm sorry the San Gabriel Conservation Corps have already asked to work with us on this is there anybody here to make public comment on item number six I do not have any public comment cards filled out on item number six. Seeing and hearing no one come forward on item number six for public comment. Public comment on item number six is not closed. So with that, we'll uh, expect to get another report back on the progress from the IT department uh, in the next 30 days. Thank you. All right. Um, now we'll go to the next item, num item number seven. Item number seven, ITA report response to motion. Card, Ms. Wesson Perry. Relative to the federally mandated transition of over-the-air broadcasting to the digital platform, DTV transition, and related matters. Thank you. Once again, William Imperial for ITA. Uh, the only additional matter that I have to, to submit to you is that we have filed a report. The I Information Technology Agency has filed a report today with the City Council, and I, I have co a copy for you here and also for uh, council member parks and hopefully get it distributed to all the council offices as soon as possible and this is the good news is that the uh, pursuant to pressure from some cities including uh, Los Angeles uh, we were able to get the FCC to um, extend the 
use of the expired coupons. In other words, if you're a coupon holder and those coupons have expired, you were not permitted to reapply. It was dead. It was expired. Your household was no longer eligible after the first deadline, or I should say the last deadline, February 17th. So they've gone ahead and decided that it's okay to do that. I know people personally that have called me and said, hey, you were right. I got my new coupons. I thought it was dead, but, you know, you should do that as soon as possible. In our letter, we set forth the www.dtv2009.gov site, but we also are providing the mailing address for those that don't have access to the web and the phone number, the toll-free number that is being responsive. The last time I checked, two weeks ago, they are being responsive, and they're answering the phones pretty quickly now. And they're doing it in six languages, by the way. So that's all I have to add. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody here to make public comment on item number seven? We're on item number seven. Public comment is open on item number seven. I do not see any public comment cards on item number seven, nor do I see anyone come forward for public comment. Therefore, public comment is closed. So with that, we'll note and file the ITA report. Thank you. Thank you. We are now finished with the items as agendized. So it is, this committee is now open for general public comment. Is there anybody here to make a general public comment to this committee? Seeing and hearing no one come forward. With that, general public comment is now closed. This committee is now adjourned.